Michael Boyles, strengthcoach.com presents the Strength Coach Podcast, brought to you by Perform Better, the experts in functional training and rehabilitation, performbetter.com. All right, hey everybody, welcome to episode 235 of the Strength Coach Podcast, the official podcast of Michael Boyles, strengthcoach.com, the world's best source for strength and conditioning information, brought to you by Perform Better, the experts in functional training and rehabilitation, performbetter.com. All right, I'm your host, Anthony Renna, and the show notes are located at continuefit.com, which I keep my other podcasts, as well as Strength Coach TV and some other resources, including my success series. I've also started uh, coaching now, so you can check out more about that on the site. All right, for the strengthcoach.com coaches corner with Coach Will, I spoke to him about timing sled sprints, about testing, and also about one of his tweets about technology. For the Results Fitness University Business of Fitness segment, Alan Cosgrove is on to talk about a new economy, the experience and transformation economy. This is a really important one. You really need to check this out. For the Functional Movement System segment, Gray Cook continues his series on the functional capacity screen. Today he goes over part four, carrying, which he considers postural integrity, under load good one from gray for the data driven coaching segment from train heroic adam Doughty is on to talk with tim robinson about culture and technology and how we can weave the two for the hit the gym with the train coach segment i have on high performance specialist former stanford director of performance brandon marcello spoke to brandon all about sleep i've been using the ready band from fatigue science to monitor my sleep this is not a paid advertisement for them i just I uh, heard Brandon talking about it and Derek Hansen talking about it. So I really wanted to, uh, my sleep is, has been a little bit off the last few months and I wanted to check on it. So uh, I talked to Ready Band about doing this and they sent me over one. It's a really accurate product. But um, I talked to Brandon about the basics of sleep because I wanted to go over it. So much talk about it right now. Some misconceptions. Uh, also, we'll talk about my results, some of the results that I got and when he's looking at, uh, they give you a lot of data, so it's really interesting. And then the, this concept of coaching sleep for our athletes and clients, which is really important because I think it's something that's missing in, in some of our coaching. All right, lots of things to get to, so let's get on the phone with Coach Boyle. All right, now it's time for the strengthcoach.com, Coach's Corner with Coach Boyle. Strengthcoach.com, the world's best source for strength and conditioning information. You can try strengthcoach.com out for three days. Just a buck, you'll have access to all the articles, videos, and programs, as well as the best forum on the net. It's the only place to have full access to Coach Boyle. He's on every day. Check it out at strengthcoach.com. All right, Coach, how you doing? I'm doing great. How are you? All right, all right. Just got back uh, from a little trip on New England, filmed some Strength Coach TVs, spoke at MBSC. That was a big honor for your interns. I really appreciate that. And then went to uh, Kevin Neal, the Mike Potenza, and James Raval's workshop on Saturday. So all good stuff. And hung out at my house in Plum Island on Thursday night, which was, I'm sure, the high point of the entire trip. It pretty much was, but I didn't want to say that. I didn't want to insult the other guy. No, it's all right. I'll say it for you. (laughs) Um, Coach, let's uh, let's get right into this with uh, some of the sled stuff. You wrote another article, More Thoughts on the Sled, and uh, you're just like, things are kind of really kind of coming together. Like Tony Holler's work inspired you to do more time tens and flying tens, and you said that's been a game changer for you. We've obviously talked a lot about that. And you feel like timed sled sprints will be the next game changer. Uh, And it sounds complicated, you say, but it's not. Talk to us about this idea and and some of the things that you feel like, uh, you know, why it's helping you guys. Well, it's funny. I'm looking at, I started writing an article, I told you this, on uh, probably Thursday of last week before I saw you. And I titled it, for 36 years I waited patiently at the train station for my ship to come in. And... um, you know, that's how I feel right now about the time sled thing, because it's like it, I'm watching it. I'm playing with it today. We had one of our guys, Ryan Bork, one of Ray Bork's kids, ran a couple of like 2.19 time tens with 75 pounds on the sled. And so we're just looking at this kind of horizontal velocity idea. And ultimately, it's going to come down to, to horizontal velocity. When you really start thinking about sports, most sports, obviously, volleyball, basketball, there's going to be some sports where vertical really matters. But ultimately, 
all of the increases that we were getting in vertical was really just to increase our horizontal power. But we never, I guess I just never really saw, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't even want to say the potential. I guess no one ever really said, hey, here's how you do it. And Cam Joss, I give Cam Joss all the credit in the world because he took J.B. Morin's work and Matt Cross's work and he made it digestible to the average person by kind of looking at the numbers that they were coming up with and then saying, hey, here's the deal. You know, 2.2 to 2.5 for 10 yards. If guys can do that, that's that's the kind of load that you need. And that comes out to about 150% of your 10 times. So you can you can dial it in a little more specifically. Obviously, our slower people can be up a little bit closer to 2.5. Our faster people need to be around, down a little bit closer to, to 2.2. But it just gave you a really easy, like, hey, I can tell you what the right weight is. Just have somebody run 10 yards with the weight, time it, and you walk away with the right, the right idea. So for us, um, and I almost, I guess, I know there's people that listen to the podcast. I hate to say it before I write it sometimes, but I have almost looked at this and said, this is like horizontal Olympic lifting. It, it, it's another really, to me, as you said, game changer, really big piece of the puzzle where I look and think, oh yeah, this really, this is a big missing piece. It's like doing a crossword and you get that one, or a, not a, a jigsaw puzzle, and you get that one piece that helps you do the whole puzzle. I really feel that way between, as you said, between Tony's idea about just timing tens, you know, getting more data and, and doing more real speed work. And then this idea of now taking that and translating some of that into the sled work. So, yeah, absolutely. Now there was a couple of questions that some people had on that. And I just wanted to ask you about that too. Just, let's just clarify. You're still, cause people always kind of be like, Oh, Mike's just doing, you know, time sleds now. That's it. Uh, you're still doing heavy sled work as well. We are <laughs> actually today. It was funny. We did a complex of heavy sled push 10 steps, sled sprint sprint. And we still did heavy sled work for the first six weeks, really heavy sled pushes. We've actually put the heavy sled pushes into the lift as a strength exercise to really work on that horizontal strength component. Because obviously I still do believe that strength is going to sort of precede and enhance power. So if we can develop that horizontal strength for people, then we're going to be able to develop more horizontal power and horizontal power really if we think about, okay, what is speed or what is acceleration, it's horizontal power. It's being able to put force into the ground that moves you forward. So yes, we're, we're still doing all those things. We're still Olympic lifting and we're still squatting. But I just, it's one of those where you look and think, as I said, if you look at it like a big jigsaw puzzle, but you get one of the corners, you're like, oh, I got a corner. And now I can figure this out. That's how I feel right now between Tony's work and um, Cam, J.B. Moore, and Matt Cross, those guys, uh, suddenly I feel like now, gee, I've got maybe I had two corners before and I've got two more, and now I'm really going to be able to complete the puzzle. Somebody had asked about uh, where do you see them fitting into your athletes' phases, and uh, and he said, I'm, I'm guessing you're still doing them with your throw-jump-sprint sequence too. Yes, it's still in that throw-jump-sprint sequence or um, – potentially as a complex contrast kind of thing within the lift. And usually I would say, it's funny, I would probably be looking at it right now and saying it's phase three if we started right in. If we have a longer period of time, which we did with our pro hockey guys this summer, we didn't start right in with time tens. We did a couple of weeks of lean fall run first to just kind of get our, our acceleration ladders actually is what we really used. And, um, and then we went to time tens in weeks like four, five, six. And then we went to fly tens six, seven, eight, and now we're starting to move in a day of fly tens and a day of sled sprint. So we're, um, but I think we can, we can slow cook this a little bit more over the summer because we're going to have way more than 12 weeks. And I think if I had only 12 weeks or 10 weeks, I'd probably start right in time and tens of week one now. Okay. Good stuff. Uh, coach, you had a great quote today, but I'll, I want to challenge you on it. I hate to sound like an old guy, but sports tech seems to be about 
guys from places like MIT selling stuff to guys from places like Harvard and bypassing the middleman. And that is the coach who will use it. I, you know, that's a great quote. I agree with it. But at the same time, I think some of this stuff, like, uh, like the sled stuff, um, and that we need a Cam Joss sometimes to kind of, you know, slap us in the back of the head to figure it out. But if we didn't have the technology, I think we're not advancing like we are. And maybe it's a good barrier for entry for uh, for some people. We can use as a secret weapon to kind of have the Cam Josses, have the Devin McConnells, who has done an amazing job, in my opinion, of taking that stuff and dumbing it down for the rest of us. Uh, just what are your thoughts on that? You know, it's funny as I started thinking about this today and sports tech, like, because I, I get frustrated because the tech is too tech. The average guy can't use it. He can't afford it and he can't figure out how to use it. And he doesn't want to have everything rigged up to an iPad and he doesn't want to have an app for everything. Because I, I was listening to um, Mike Young today from uh, Sports Lab talk about some of the tech stuff. And I'm thinking I would really love for somebody to come up with a velocity based piece that you could just put on the bar and, and, and the piece told you what the speed was. I didn't need a freaking app. I didn't need to link it to my phone. I didn't need to do all this other bullshit that you have to do. I just clipped this thing on almost like a collar on the bar, clip it on like a collar, like Tendo was, but with no wire. And when the bar moves, I know how fast the bar moved. And it was really simple. And it was like one button. That's what I love. We have a Brower timing system. The Brower timing system is great. You turn it on and you sprint. And you got a little handheld remote that has everything right on it. And you don't need your phone. You don't need an app. I just feel like it's, like I said, it's a guy from MIT who's so smart, you know, trying to sell to like a GM or one of these sports science guys who went to Harvard or Yale or one of these places. And they're all geeked out about, oh, yeah, you know, it's got this cool iPad app, blah, blah, blah. And the coach is like, shit. It's another day I got to bring the friggin' iPad out, another app I have to have on the iPad. I think people aren't seeing really what's going on in the actual field and realizing simpler is better. Like that same thing. I love our heart rate monitor system. The MyZone system I love. You put it on, it comes up on the TV screen. I can look and I know what your heart rate is. That's really simple for me. I need simple because simple – when you've got a lot of people and you, you know, you're a big operation or you're, you're a big team, whatever it is, like these teams, they got to like hire a GPS guy whose job is just to figure out how to you know, take care of all the whatever, catapult or whatever it is and get the data downloaded. And it's like a whole job for a guy. And then you think, how much am I really using that? And did I really need to create another job for that guy? And wouldn't it have been cool if we could have something easier? I just think it's more about easy than it is about the depth of the data. All right, so what you need to do is go to one of these tech companies, get some, tell them to raise some money, and then you have like a contest with some of these MIT and Harvard guys, get them into MBSC for like a week, following you around, and you just say, no, here you go, this is what I need, and then have a contest. And then the winner basically, uh, you know, comes up with this product that you're going to sell with them and the tech company and that and that guy behind the guy. So it's probably very true because this is what I love about Apple. I love the simplicity of Apple. I love the simplicity. I love we talk you and I were talking about the first generation iPod with the wheel and all that stuff. And I remember getting an MP3 player and thinking, what the heck is an MP3? How do I get them on this thing? How do I use it? How do I hook it up? And then you get the iPod and it's like, bing, bing, bing. All the songs are on it. You know what I mean? Like, how do they how do they make stuff so simple? They make stuff so simple because they really understand the need and the process. And that's why they kick everybody's ass. They kick everybody's ass in the tech world because they're not trying to show you how smart they are. They're trying to show you that we're so freaking smart that we can take an incredibly complex idea make it hugely simple and sell an absolute shitload of them. So that to me is what it's about. Yeah. I, I always thought it was kind of ironic that the, like, I don't know if it was Samsung or they always showed like the Apple line 
And then they were saying, you know, there was old people, older people in the line. They were like, oh, yeah, see, those are older people, whatever. It was like, yeah, that's because they don't really understand the technology and the and the iPhone is so easy to use. Like all, you know, you get the iPad, the iPhone and the Mac and it's all just integrated so easily and so smoothly that it's easy and anybody can understand it. So I agree with you 100 percent there. Yeah, no, exactly. And and that when you I don't think you can find a better kind of company example than Apple. And it's no surprise when you look and think, okay, I mean, it's one of the most valuable stocks in the world because of their ability. And, you know, you think about it's all old people, but who do you want adopting tech? Oh, how about all the old people with the money? They'd be a good group to go after. No, let's just go after kids who have no money. They, that'd be smart. You know what I mean? You look and they go, well, the young, you know, the millennials, the early adopters. It's like, that's great. Except they don't have the money yeah. to have, um, you know, an iMac and a MacBook Pro and an iPhone. And what are they going to buy their kids? And it was interesting. One of my friends who, and when I, I bought Apple stock very early on and I've kept it, I've never sold any of my Apple stock at all. And one of my friends, David Baxter, who at that time was a, uh, a vice president at Reebok had said, you know, Apple's so smart with the little, you know, the, the iPod minis and the, the, whatever the, the one, the other little teeny one, the shuffle, he said, because they're getting kids hooked on Apple early and those kids are going to get an iPhone and those kids are going to be Mac people. He said, Apple is creating customers for life with these little inexpensive music players. And I was like, wow, he's so right. And you realize that you've got a whole generation of kids who are going to grow up and think, I mean, they're never even going to consider PC options because of the way they've grown up. And it's, it's just brilliant. It's simple to me, simple is brilliant. Complicated is not brilliant because I don't have time for complicated. Absolutely. All right. Coach, uh, there was a, uh, somebody had asked you about your testing, speed, jumping power, agility, leg strength, upper body strength, conditioning. And uh, so part of the theme was nothing with middle school and high school. And then, you know, you told them what you did in the team settings. And you said, look, I don't believe it in the private setting. I think it's a reward for superior genetics and will discourage business in the private sector. But, you know, what if we, you know, did some testing without really – talking to them about it or just talking to them about it specifically and not making it like, oh, you're 17th or you're 15th or you're third. Um, you know, just from a perspective of, uh, you know, you said strength conditioning is an opportunity to get better, but how do you know if you're getting better? Well, you know, it's really funny. I can remember, and I, I probably when I go back to this um, thread, I'll post Johnny Parker's quote. When I asked Johnny Parker years ago about testing with the Patriots, he said, Mike, we do test. He said, we test 16 times a year, and we get evaluated based on how we do on those tests. And I kind of laughed. I was like, okay, I get it. If, you, if you're winning games, you're passing the test. And so um, I think, it's, particularly in the private world, kids will get better. And we've seen it. It's so obvious that they're better when they go play that other parents follow them to the facility. Other parents literally will look and be like, what the heck happened to Anthony? You know, last year, Anthony wasn't that good. He was on the third line and he wasn't very fast. And all of a sudden he's faster and he's on the second line. And, you know, my kid's got his third line spot and looks slow as whale shit compared to him. And so, because I think what happens is strength and conditioning, and this is strength and conditioning, personal training, everything. It's an intimidating environment. And this is why I firmly believe, and I've said this before, I think that one of the big failings of Velocity as a franchise was the huge emphasis on testing. You know, we'll lower your kid's 40 time or your money back kind of thing. And so you've got a kid going into this environment, and I know you've heard me say this before, but when you go someplace and you're already nervous and your parents are already bringing you because you're not good at sports, they're not bringing you because you are usually, they're bringing you because you're not, and the first thing you go in, it's like, hey, you know, your, your dad thinks you suck. And what we're going to do is evaluate it and establish that you really do suck. Then we're going to give him all the data that shows how much you suck so that he can be really mad at you on the ride home from this 
first experience with us here <laughs> at our center. And boy, do I hope you tell your friends and come back. I don't see that as a good business model. I've never seen it, and I, I always laugh at everybody. We're the most successful for-profit strength and conditioning company probably in the world, and we don't test. And we deliberately don't test because we see it as negative reinforcement. We see it as a the first negative experience. And we don't want the first experience to be negative because it's already anxiety producing. I want that kid to come in and think, that was awesome. I love the coaches. They taught me stuff. I was learning how to move better. I felt better when I left. Not, oh my God, I ran a six flat 40. Now my dad really thinks I suck. You know what I mean? It's like, I just feel like people get it all wrong. In a team setting, it's different. These team athletes, if I've got my guys at BU or I've got my Olympic girls, you know something? I'm not worried about their self-image. And I say it all the time. Hey, you know, if they don't, if they get their feelings hurt, tough shit. It, it, you know, I'm not going to worry about that. You want to play in the Olympics or you want to play Division One hockey, you better be ready to get your feelings hurt. And you better be ready to have someone say, you're not the fat, you know, you're not the best anymore. But I don't think that works at all in private setting. And as I said, I think it works in reality in an opposite um, kind of way. Interesting that you brought up Velocity because I actually, when I read that quote, I kind of was thinking Velocity actually popped in my head as like, because I remember when I first got in this business, they were like on every street corner next to Starbucks. And now you don't hear a lot about that franchise. So um, interesting. Exactly. No, and that's, that's what I mean. I think that's, and I believe that was a huge part of the failing was in the fact that it was so evaluation based and and I it was I guess it was just not good planning because I think everybody thought that you know you get into this so it's the whole thing we're talking about with, with tech, the whole data driven idea. Well you don't know how good you are if you don't know where you started. And I get that part and I, I'm well aware of it. But I really one of the things and I, I've said this I think I started doing this, I'm trying to think. Um, I probably started training kids on the side in the summer, um, 25 years ago. And the one thing that I remembered right off the bat was that I didn't get any feedback that was really related to numbers. I got feedback that was related to behaviors. Parents would come to me and say, you know, my, my son loves working out now. He eats right. You know, he's so much more conscientious. He's like a different person, blah, blah, blah. Never, oh, you know, Anthony scored six goals in his game. And, you know, I can't believe how much better he got. I didn't get any of that. But I got so much of the other stuff. And I started to realize, wow, there's a huge business in this. But the business is probably much more in the self-esteem raising process than it is in the actual physical change that you're making. And I went with that. I went with that, and I and I still believe it today. Yeah, it's funny. It just reminds me of that story that I told that you you heard it the other day of my client Anne, where just you know you start to realize it's not always about aesthetics or those specific things that you think or that people think it would be. So definitely. exactly, and that you you were I I love that story because I said you're a hundred percent right, and I had the same story. I had a good friend of mine who I went to his wife's wake and I never knew his wife was sick and I had been training him for a long time. And when I went to the wake and he was a very uh, powerful, important guy at BU. And I went to his wake, like in my gym stuff or her wake in my gym stuff. Cause it, I found out at the last minute that, you know, that she had passed away and I didn't even know that she was sick. And I went in there and this guy was hugging me and saying to me, you know, you helped me so much to get through this. You know, if it hadn't been for working out and the time with you, you know, I don't know what I would have done. And everybody else is looking at me like, what? And I'm looking back at them like, I sorry, I didn't, I had no idea. And, and a lot of times you don't. The good thing for me is I didn't know what I was doing in the beginning, but I realized fairly quickly and looked and said, Oh, wait a second here. There's um, there's some stuff going on that I was initially unaware of, but now that I'm aware of it, I need to react to it and react to it appropriately. Which you know, appropriate reaction was. Hey, let's keep doing what we're doing and let's not uh, all of a sudden start, you know, we're going to test everybody and, you know, that's going to be what we are all about. So we're we've never been about that and we won't be. 
Good stuff. Yep. It's the impact that you have. I think uh, we, we need to understand that more. Great stuff. And I think uh, good things come out of it, especially great quotes like slow as well shit, because I need to come up with some kind of thing. <laughs> I got to use that quote again, man. That was awesome. Slow as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not exactly sure if whale shit's really slow. But. I know, there we go. Who knows? But you know, I think if, if you, we say it, you people no, you really, you don't want to know. That's one thing you'll realize. <laughs> you probably don't want to be on the receiving end of that, regardless of the speed. <laughs> but I think if we start saying that, people will start to use it because it just sounds good. <laughs> anyway, um, all right, coach, I'll let you go on that note. Thanks again, and we'll talk to you next time. All right. Thanks, Ant. All right, right now at Perform Better, the huge summer sale. You know they do this every year, 40% off. So many items, sleds, dumbbells, kettlebells, foam rollers, you name it, it's on sale. All of their best items. That is going on sale, 40% off. Don't forget Chicago Perform Better Summit this weekend, July 27th to 29th. And then the Long Beach Summit on August 17th to 19th. You can check out performbetter.com for all their products and info on their educational seminars. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Business of Fitness section, brought to you by ResultsFitnessUniversity.com. Uh, my name is Alan Cosgrove, you probably know that unless this is your first ever podcast, and if it is, hey, welcome. So I'm going to talk about something now is that we're moving into a new economy, and I feel like the best name for this economy is the experience and transformation economy, right? So I recently flew with a new airline, they're called JetSuiteX, JetSuiteX.com. There's the plug for you guys, Jet Sweet X. That one's on me. Next one, you're going to have to sponsor Anthony Renner's podcast. Um, basically, it's as close to flying a private jet as you can get at a much lower price. They actually call themselves semi private flying, right? The most interesting part for me was that the price wasn't really much different than flying uh, Southwest. It was a short flight that I was going up to San Francisco. It's a small plane, very clean, with great service. But I expect that. that. I don't expect poor service or a dirty plane. The best part of the whole experience is that you park at the gate and you check in 15 minutes before your flight and you walk straight on board. And when you land, you walk right out to your car. When I landed in San Francisco, we hit the ground and I had ordered an Uber and it was maybe three minutes before I was off the plane and walking towards the Uber, right? That whole experience was just better than flying commercial despite the result being the same the result was getting to my destination safely and on time so it's not just the result that people pay for anymore right so with thousands of choices for people's time uh, and really it, in fitness we're their leisure time and they're having less and less of that and they've got a multitude of different options from from 30 minute infomercials selling DVDs and downloads to boot camps, to kettlebells, to fitness books. Your greatest marketing enemy is that there might not be any way you stand out. If I look in at your boot camp or your class, it looks like people sweating and smiling. I go down the street and I see another one, it looks the same. How do you stand out? So just think, if you were in the market for a fitness trainer in today's economy, if you, I want you to think about this, and you had two trainers with equal training skills, wouldn't you just choose the one that's less expensive? Of course you would. Everybody does that. Every time someone goes to the pharmacy and purchases a generic brand instead of a, a name brand, or your insurance requires that, unless a doctor uh, requests differently, the, it, the generic has the same ingredients as the brand name. If there isn't anything about your business that says to prospects, we are different, then they will always, always, always choose the cheapest option. So we have to bring us to value and the experience and transformation economy. So a cup of coffee as a commodity is about 15 cents. Starbucks made that into a $6 experience. Is it because their coffee is better or made with a different type of water? No. It's the same as the diner across the street that's selling it for 50 cents, right? Starbucks has embraced the coffee experience, the lighting, the mood, the terminology, the chairs, the colors, the asking your name, the, the writing your name on the cup. They provide a different experience than merely getting hot water with, with caffeine. So there's a book in 1999, The Experience Economy, because there's, there's really four types of businesses, four or five types of businesses. A commodity business charges for undifferentiated products. A goods business charges for distinctive, tangible things. 
right? It's a step up from a commodity. A service business charges you for the activities you perform. An experience business charges for the feeling you get by engaging it. That's a step up from just the service. And the reason why a limo costs more than an Uber or a cab. But a transformation business charges for the benefit customers receive by spending time there because they become a different person. We have to be at the experience and transformation look like. And Yannick Silver, who's a marketing expert, refers to this differentiation as astonishment architecture, right? So what would the ultimate blank look like? What would the ultimate fitness session look like? What would the ultimate group class look like? And how can you do that? So so here's your action step. Make a list of businesses that have blown you away with, with the experience that they've provided. Like JetSuite well, X is one for, for mine. Uh, Virgin Atlantic flying from flying to Scotland. Um, the Palms in Las Vegas, the Hard Rock Hotel in San Diego. There's a bunch of it. Ones that just went, this is, this is awesome. This is different. I, I like this, right? And make your own list and determine why these businesses stood out and why they were so much better than the competition. So in our world, what would the ultimate fitness experience or gym or training studio look, feel, or be like? And here's why we need, need to change because the marketplace is always trying to make things cheaper. I can tell you from a, a guy who sells information products who perform better, DVDs and education, you know, that, that's trending towards zero because people are going to, on a, to YouTube to get stuff for free and, and searching that. Unless there's something superly different or unique about you, they'll go for the cheapest option. Customer service is at an all-time low right now. And as a result, customer expectations are even lower. And we can only compete in three ways, right? Quality, customer service, and price. Right, quality and service right now are an all-time low, so price becomes a deciding factor. And why would you pay more? So, what can you do today to reinvent your service and create the ultimate training experience? Think of what the prospect sees. Does your exercises look the same as the others? Do you dress the same? Does your workout sheets the same black text on an A4 piece of paper? Does your workout last the same length of time as everybody else? Does your warm-ups look like the same? When they try you out for seven days, is it just a generic workout? Now, I know anyone listening to this can deliver better results in the competition, but that takes time. The client's initial experience, their, their feeling of that training session, their initial evaluation, that's instantaneous. So right now, I want you to list five skills you could focus on to upgrade your training ability. Are you multi-talented with tools? Do you, do you know the TRX, kettlebells, uh, the DVRT sandbags? Do you know all that stuff, right? Uh, can you change your workout techniques to get the same results without having to resort to the same things? How's your communication skills? When's the last time you overhauled your training philosophy? What was the last book you read and implemented for the client? What was the last seminar you attended? And what did you implement when you were there, right? And here's a little test for you. Work out only as often as your average client does using the same exercises, sets, and reps as if your identical twin were a client training twice a week. Then ask yourself if that experience is something that you'd pay top dollar for and look forward to using on a regular basis. And if the answer is yes, then maximize that and turn it up. Turn up to 11 like, like in Spinal Tap. And if the answer is no, what would you change? Maybe it's too hard and you dread going to the gym. Maybe it leaves you too sore so the rest of the week. You know, you don't feel good. Or maybe it's too technical and leaves you with a feeling of accomplishment. But regardless, go through the client experience yourself and see if you can take it and, and make what you do more than just a service business and turn it into an experience and transformation business because that's the economy we're in. All right, guys, hope that was helpful. That was a deep one uh, this week. Uh, any follow-up, you can reach out to me on social media or at resultsfitnessuniversity.com uh, or as usual over in the strengthcoach.com forums in the business section. And I'll talk to you guys soon. Hey, this is Adam. And this is Tim. Welcome to the Train Hook Data-Driven Coaching segment. You know, today, Tim, I'd actually like to talk about an experience I just had this past weekend we were up at the Play uh, X Lab. It's focused on technology cool. up here at CSU in Fort Collins. Yeah. It was an awesome event. But the thing I noticed that really struck me was that, yeah, you know, all the speakers were talking about how they use GPS and other tech. But the questions the attendees had really centered around, like, hey, how do I build a better culture? Ooh, awesome. Which, you know, really is like a – it's a more important, like, fundamental thing. Sure. Which you don't have – if you don't have that, then you're trying to build, like, a castle on sand. Yeah. So 
briefly, I know you had experience, so talk to me about that for a minute. Yeah, so every time I enter the training environment or the practice environment, I set some simple guidelines for myself, and I call these guidelines DMC. It's destination, motivation, communication. Destination's your end goal. Uh, motivation, obviously, how do you get your, your people or your team motivated in communication? Coaching is all about expertly and efficiently communicating. And technology can actually help with those second two points, right? Use Train Heroic, for example, uh, motivation. We use leaderboards and things like that to increase competition as well, and, and communication. Nothing's easier than just sending out a mass message through a live feed. You know what I mean? And those things are essential to holding together, uh, you know, a solid culture. Yeah, but like if we step back and talk about it, right? It's like technology is going to help you kind of maybe promote some of those aspects yeah. of the culture you want. So take that leaderboard, for example, uh, which I have a pretty cool story about, but is that, you know, if you don't have the, the culture in place of like, hey, we work as a team, you know, we're a team everywhere, right. we pick each other up, we work hard, you know, every time out, that kind yeah. of thing. Like that leaderboard is just going to be kind of like, it's be like lipstick on a pig. That's it. You know, it's, it's funny because those, that stuff is really just conjecture until you put it into action. You know what I mean? So unless you're doing those things every day, every week, right? It really doesn't mean anything. Everyone wants right. to work hard. Everyone wants to, you know, needs 100% effort, all those things. Right. You know, I think the best uh, thing that came out of that I heard some, uh, one of the speakers say in one of the breakout sessions was somebody asked, hey, how to build a better culture? And he goes, well, what's your culture? Yeah. No answer. No answer. Because, you know, his point was like, hey, if you can't explain, if yeah. you can't tell me what your tenets are. Unfortunately, that happens a lot, I think. Right. But if you look at any group that's out there, right, any that is known for their culture, being cohesive, team, like, you look at our military groups, special forces, you look at fire, police, boy scouts, religion, not yeah. political. No. They all have like lists of values and things that they, they live by. Sure. Right. So you have to have those things in place before you can expect other people to know what they are. No question. So at this play lab, this cool thing happened is that like, you know, I wanted to get a little, uh, we had a little demo, so I wanted to have a little competition. So I put a leaderboard in there. And I was thinking about all kinds of complicated stuff. And I was like, okay, screw it. We're going to do push ups. There's max yeah. reps in a minute. Awesome. Simplest, dumbest thing, honestly. <laughs> it was easy for me to execute. Yeah. But you know what? I was gifted a culture in that room because yeah. I had maybe 40 professional strength coaches, people who showed up on a Saturday to learn, people who already had values like hard work and discipline and teamwork. And that room just erupted. It took on a life of its own. It was amazing. Unbelievable. But that's because everything else was in place. Yeah, great. Hey, that's going to do it for us today. Go to trainhook.com to start your 14-day free trial. And when you're talking to one of our representatives, be sure to tell them the Strength Coach Podcast sent you for 10% off the year or the pro or leader edition. Well, we had run, jump, carry, and climb. And crawling and climbing sort of work off the same thing. If you can crawl, you can climb. Maybe not great, but you've got the same patterns down. So what's the next most important thing? Well, before a baby even starts leaning forward and running or jumping, they start picking up things. And as soon as they start picking those things up, they want to combine two activities. They want to grab something but then they want to change their body's location as well as the location of the object. So babies start carrying stuff. Now, if, if you're big into lifting, you could say, well, they got to lift it if they're going to carry it. But are they lifting max loads or submax loads? They're, they're, they're lifting submax loads and carrying them for longer distances. Babies will, will engage a heavy object, but they're not entertained by that object. They're entertained by things they can pick up and manipulate and carry. And when we take on a little bit extra weight, a baby's already at a disadvantage because they're top heavy. Their center of mass is a little bit higher. So when a baby carries something, there's a huge asymmetrical or offset load, or if anything, just a perturbation to their center of mass over their base of support. Carrying is something we do naturally as humans, not just lifting, but carrying. Lifting is a prime mover activity, and carrying is almost more of a postural stabilizer activity. So in a lot of work I did in, in carrying a few years ago, working with Dan John and just saying, let's get the semantics of carrying right. I almost think a Turkish getup is a vertical carry, and a farmer's walk is sort of a horizontal carry. But really, what are we looking for? Postural integrity under load. Meaning when you hang something on your posture, the Turkish getup isn't a lift. You press the bell before you even come off the ground. You stand up under an already pressed bell. That is a postural activity. Whether you think it's a good workout or not, it's basically showing me that you control your posture, not with a max load, but with a submax load that creates balance complexity 
before it worries about farmer carry capacity. Dan John and I in a DVD also talk about a six position carry. Overhead, front rack, suitcase, switch sides, overhead, front rack, suitcase, walk on. This is going to be a 10 minute drill and you will not set the kettlebell down, but I'm thinking you're an idiot for not switching arm position when your arm starts to falter or waver. I need you to perceive your lack of integrity before you do. This is something I would love to baseline because if we're going to use carry as an exercise, we better damn well test it first. Or you're one of those people hoping your exercise works instead of strategically charting whether your exercise works or not. The carry that I'm getting ready to propose is almost informative is grip strength testing. And I'm not going to give you a bunch about grip strength testing here. You got to Google at your fingertips. Figure out how much grip strength testing tells us more than just how strong your forearm is. It actually imparts the integrity of everything from your spine to your fingertips because if there's any disharmony from your nerve roots coming out of your neck all the way down to your fingertips, whether it's tendonitis in the elbow, supraspinatus tendonitis, poor scapular stability, nerve root compression, your body will downregulate your grip to keep you from grabbing something that you used to be strong enough to handle but currently have no business touching, right? Your subconscious brain, when, when you're in compromise, when you're in pain, when you're inflamed, and when you're injured, is smarter than your conscious brain that's just trying to finish a set that doesn't mean shit to anybody. So most of what I get to deal with in physical therapy is inhibition. And I will not call it strength, and I will not call the farmer's carry strength because that word has been almost bastardized. However, if you've been on a strength training program for six months and you cannot complete the carry test that I'm getting ready to tell you about, I think I'm within my right to question the strength training program you've been on. It's either too specific or ineffective. We've arrived at a farmer's carry that you do at 75% of your body weight. Before you think about doing it to your 75-year-old client, I think grip strength will give us all we need there and set a baseline for whether you're strengthening somebody or not. Not by a specific set of lifts because if you are using the deadlift as a test and then you practice the deadlift, you're practicing the test. I don't know if this person's getting authentically, authentically strong in a bunch of directions or just specifically strong in the isolated lift you're teaching them. But in Western culture, we are absolutely stupid for practicing a test. Set a test that demonstrates an authentic base and don't practice it. That way, if you're doing something that's generating better capacity in the system, simply measure it with your thin slice. We've got specific distances and times we like to see you carry, and you can be under the cut, right at the cut, or over the cut, and it will inform you if that's your weakest link in carrying. Postural integrity under control is the base of all strength. Next, we're going to talk a little bit about power. All right, now it's time for the Hit the Gym with a Strength Coach. And today I have on Brandon Marcello. And Brandon is a high performance strategist. He's basically a consultant who uh, helps teams, the military, uh, work on human performance problems. He's a recognized author, researcher, and international presenter. Uh, he's been on the show a bunch of times. Former director of sports performance at Stanford University. And when he was there, we were talking about a long time ago. Uh, probably almost 10 years ago about some of this stuff with sleep. And I wanted to get him on to talk more about that because it's been so much talk about it lately. So Brandon, thanks for doing this. Always glad to be here, Anthony. All right. Well, um, all right. Let me just tell everybody how this happened. So I have my book coming out on success in the fitness industry and you're a part of it. And as I was doing some editing, both you and Derek Hansen had mentioned, uh, a product that you are working with uh, right now, uh, and that was the Ready Band from a company called Fatigue Science. And I'm really interested in sleep. I know how important it is. Over the last couple of years, I've really been trying to change, you know, work, growing up, working in the bar business way before the fitness right. industry, I was like really kind of had this idea that I was a night owl. So that transition to kind of turn it around and I've done it, but I still have some issues with with my sleeping and, and I definitely, uh, uh, certainly I like to have a couple drinks, uh, at night, uh, and that doesn't help. 
Um, and uh, my wife, and we'll talk a little bit about this. My wife is a bad sleeper, so that doesn't help as well. So, but I wanted to get you on to talk about some of this. So, um, and that's where this came from. Uh, and so I got a ready band from Fatigue Science, and uh, which normally it's it's reserved for teams. It's a great product. Um, where, uh, but I want to talk about uh, some of my results. But let's let's kind of go back to this idea about sleep. Just give us a little bit of the evolution of what you feel like has maybe you've learned or you've changed. Because we, like I said, you ha- give us give everybody the rundown one more time about uh, how you really got into this with the Stanford Sleep Center and um, uh, when you were there and some of the things that might have changed or some of the research that we've found. Because everybody seems to be talking about this now. Sure. So, you know, I got, I got involved, uh, with sleep in 2007. Um, you know, part of my charter was, you know, how, when when I got the job at Stanford was, you know, how do we, how can I leverage academics and benefit us on the performance side? And that really allowed me to take a deep dive in what they offered there, um, from a research standpoint, from an academic standpoint. And, And obviously, you know, Stanford has a pretty pretty solid name when it comes to, to, to anything they do, um, on the academic side. So, um, you know, I, I reached out to the Stanford sleep center and I, uh, contacted a man by the name of, um, William DeMent. Okay. William C. DeMent. And, and he is considered, uh, the father of sleep medicine. I mean, he's the guy that pretty much discovered REM. Uh, he's 87 years old. Um, one of the nicest guys you'll ever meet, but he, you know, like left a message. He called me right back and said, I'd love to be involved. He goes, you're the first person from athletics to ever call me. Wow. And I, I was, I was floored, right. That, you know, people haven't tapped into this guy as a resource, a 10 minute walk from my office and no one's picked up the phone to call him. Very nice, very giving. We set up a meeting. I go over to his office and uh, a colleague of his who was a master's student at the time, I believe, Sherry Ma, who is now Dr. Sherry Ma. She has a, an MD, um, was really interested in the world of sports performance and sleep. So she had just launched this study for, uh, basketball players. And, um, we worked together throughout that study and worked with my coaches who were on staff with basketball. And she published this pretty much this first study on, you know, it's called the Stanford basketball study, which they looked at sleep extension or meaning extending your sleep, right? I'm sleeping more than I typically do. And if it affects human performance. And, and sure enough, it did. And significantly, I might add. So um, anyway, along the line, we'd bring them in to do a coach's education. I would leverage their expertise. They would talk to teams, et cetera, et cetera. But it became this like hobby of mine all of a sudden. You know, I'm not a sleep scientist. I, I don't diagnose sleep issues. I can't do that, right? But this notion of having a good understanding of sleep, how it impacts performance, um, some basics around sleep mythology um, became really this like exciting thing for me. So I would die. I dove into it and, you know, um, that got me into vetting sleep technologies and then having discussions with other people and, you know, really exploring this area of sleep and human performance, but from a standpoint of a strength coach, right. A sports performance coach, um, not a medical professional. So w- being able to kind of parse out the information and say, what is it that we really should know and need to know? And what is it that we don't need to know? So like when I spoke uh, or I am speaking at Perform Better this year, it's like, you know, I don't talk about sleep architecture or, you know, here's what this cycle of sleep does or this sleep cycle does, or here's when this one takes place, because I don't think that's anything what we really need to know in our profession. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, that's kind of how it came, came about and was, has really become this like pet project of mine and uh, I've really enjoyed it and I've learned tons. And so what do we need to know in terms of, I mean, cause look, I mean, ever since I, I can remember as a yep. kid, even I heard, okay, eight hours of sleep. So it's yep. not like anything new and it, I, it like, it's kind of like a slap in the back of the head moment where it's like, 
okay, we need more sleep to play better. Of course, that what? Why would we even need to think about that? That that doesn't even need to be said. I would think, right? But we don't seem to follow through with it. So, what is it, like you said, that we need to know as strength coaches? Well, I think one thing we need to know is that first thing you have to coach sleep. And that's my number one takeaway in my presentation is you have to coach sleep. Love that. Um, you don't have to diagnose sleep issues, right? But you have to coach it. You have to make sure that these athletes that you're working with or fitness uh, or your, your, your clients, right? If you're a fitness person or a personal trainer, whatever it might be, um, that they put sleep at the very top of the list. You know, you're in a role where you're trying to make physical changes. I'm trying to either decrease body composition, you know, decrease body fat, improve lean body mass. I'm trying to improve strength. I'm trying to improve power. I'm trying to uh, improve capacity, mobility, flexibility, whatever it might be. Some instances I might need to decrease mobility, right? But all of these things are going to be much harder to accomplish if the individual whom with you're working does not have a base of solid sleep. So in other words, if you focus on sleep with these individuals, odds are that your program is going to show greater benefits in a shorter amount of time. And that's fantastic for you. Do you think, and this is a loaded question, but, and I don't want, if I was, had a gun to your head and I said, all right, you can only <laughs> coach one thing, uh, sleep or nutrition. Oh, simple sleep. Wow. And now, and this is a funny thing. And I talk about this in my presentation, right? And, but it, you know, I, my, my PhD is in nutrition. Mm -hmm. So it's like you have a guy who studied nutrition, but he doesn't put it first, right? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there is a huge sleep nutrition interaction. And one of the things that I, I talk about is the fact that if you are sleep deprived, um, you actually alter your carbohydrate metabolism. So your metabolism does not metabolize carbohydrates to the level that it normally does when you're well rested. So it's become inefficient which is why people who are sleep deprived tend to crave carbohydrates. What types of carbohydrates do they crave? Typically junk food, because those are the ones that typically absorb faster and can get in the bloodstream quicker. Those are also likely the unhealthier ones as well, right? So, um, you know, we, we talk about optimizing nutrition, but if, again, if that's built on a platform of non-optimal sleep, suboptimal sleep, then, then you're, you know, it's going to be a lot harder. Now you can do it, but it's just going to be a lot harder. It's amazing. Yeah. Um, because again, I, I think sometimes we tend to say, okay, we're just gonna, you know, keep all of these, you know, relatively equal when people come in, all right, I want to, you know, we got to work on our training, want to work on our nutrition, work on our sleep. But I love that idea of, you know, that saying you have to coach sleep and, Part of the problem is, I think, anyway, just based off of, you can, we'll go over my results in a little bit, but so, and I think I, when I read Sean Stevenson's book, Sleep Smarter, which I thought was really brilliant um, in terms of giving you a lot of suggestions and, and, you know, like, look, there's not one way to do things. Here's a few, here's 21 ways to plus to, to do it. But um, one thing that I, uh, that they were talking about was with, you know, people like to have a drink or two, like a glass of wine or two. And they say, I guess there were some studies that said, yes, it helps you fall asleep, but it ruins your sleep. Even though you might say in the morning, you might feel like, yeah, wow, I, got a, I slept through the night. I got to sleep really early. Wow, I slept for eight hours. But it might not have been good quality sleep. And that's why I felt like the, I really wanted to look into ready band. Oh, absolutely. And you're right. I mean, that's the thing. Alcohol, alcohol doesn't help you sleep. Alcohol helps you pass out. Okay. Uh, <laughs> you know, um, now there is, there is a small amount of alcohol that one can consume, which will wind you down and help you get a restful night's sleep. Right. And then the follow-up question immediately is, well, how much is that? Um, but I don't know the answer to it. It's going to be different for everybody. Right. But it's a very, very, um, it's a tightrope, right? You drink too much. And like you said, you, it interferes with your ability to get a good night's rest. You skip over the regenerative stages of sleep. Um, you might have some more, much more awakenings that you maybe not even realize, right? It's going to affect people a little bit differently, but at the end of the day, you're right. Too much alcohol, not a good thing. A little bit of alcohol can help. How much? We just don't know. Yeah. 
Is there really such a thing as a night owl, Brandon? Because I, if anybody was one, it was me for sure. Yeah. And now I'm the opposite. But is it really? I mean, are we different? Are we that different? Or is it for in general? Are we, uh, for the most part, like we should be sleeping, you know, at night, you know, between 10 and five in the morning or six in the morning. Uh, Talk to me about that. Well, there are, there are differences. There are larks and there are owls, right? And the owl is what you, you know, you used to be in your former life. You know, Um, you like to go to bed late and you get up late and uh, there are larks early to bed, early to rise. Um, and, And those things are real. Um, very much real. So, you know, it's, it's, I think the problem is when you all of a sudden you start like working during the day instead of sleeping at night, right? That's a little bit different um, and, and creates a whole another host of issues. But, you know, if you go to bed at 11 o'clock at night compared to somebody who goes to bed at nine, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. Um, maybe our environment has changed that a little bit, right? Because of lights and TV and those types of things. Um, but, there are larks and there are owls. I'm an owl by nature. Um, I prefer to go to bed later, but I also prefer to get up later. Now, I don't have that luxury of being able to wake up at nine in the morning, right? Mm. And go to bed at one. So I've had to change and like yourself, become a lark. Um, and that is easy to do when you can change yourself. The problem is, is most people like us, we revert back to our night owl behaviors on the weekend and then it becomes inconsistent and when our sleep becomes inconsistent that's when we have a hard time with consistent sleep hygiene absolutely so can you just give us an overview of the best practices for food because i've heard like okay um you know hey three hours before bed or there's certain things obviously that you don't want to have uh, yeah. for dinner or, you know, eat too late. Just give us an overview of, of the food idea before bed. Yeah. So a little bit of a loaded question, but you know, again, I think everybody's going to respond a little differently. Mm-hmm. Um, so like some of the athletes I work with, um, they'll come to me over this issue, right? It will be a sleep issue, but then it turns into a nutrition issue because, you know, these guys might have a late game. Um, then they're trying to wind down. They have to eat something right at like 1130 at night. Um, and they're starving because they haven't eaten in, in hours, right? Except a bar maybe or a bite of a bar. Um, so now all of a sudden, because they're so full or they eat too much, they can't fall asleep. Some guys will get like heartburn, right? And that interferes with their ability to fall asleep. Yeah, I try to sleep, but I have to try to sleep propped up, but then it hurts my back and then I'm in pain and then I can't sleep. So food definitely, it is a two-way interaction, right? Sleep can influence nutrition and nutrition can influence sleep, just like you said. So in terms of a rule, right, that's kind of tough because um, everybody's going to be individual. I know people that can eat an hour before they go to bed. And it doesn't affect them at all. I know people that have to eat four hours before they go to bed, right, and cut caffeine um, before 4 o'clock p.m. or else they're going to be up and have interruptions in the night. So it's very much individualized. This is where you have to pay attention, and this is really where – and I might be skipping ahead with what we want to talk about, but this is where it goes beyond more just sleep quantity and sleep quality. You know, if you're coaching sleep and you have a client, athlete or, or, or general population that has trouble sleeping, you have to start to ask them the correct questions. What do I mean by that? I mean, well, why are you not able to sleep? Is it because of temperature? Maybe too cold, too hot in your room. Is it because of noise? You know, maybe their partner snores. Um, is it because uh, maybe their partner's restless and moves around and keeps them awake? Um, maybe they're in pain. Yeah. My, I like to sleep on my left side, but my left shoulder always hurts. So I can't sleep. I would love to sleep, but my body hurts. Right. Um, you know, it may, it could, it could be a number of different reasons or it could be, you know, I work late, I get home, I need to eat. And then that interferes with my ability to fall asleep. So then I sit in front of TV until, you know, one in the morning when finally my food feels digested and I can go back to sleep. So it's one thing telling your clients or your athletes to get eight hours of sleep, but you have to begin by asking the right questions of why may, might they not be getting the sleep that they need? I think, again, we've been talking on here a lot about monitoring uh, yeah. a lot of different things, but this is obviously we need to even go deeper 
and to to find out, not just say, hey, how many hours of sleep did you get? Was it good? Um, but we need to start to figure out like when they don't get that sleep, uh, what what is the reason? Is there anything yeah. that you're kind of again because you've been you've been really involved in this research for so long? Is there anything now that you're hearing out there that you're feeling like, oh, you know what, guys, we gotta calm down with that that's really probably not true we don't have enough research on that yet but is there anything out there now because everybody and their mother is talking about sleep so uh when that happens we start to get some some misinformation what do you feel like uh that is there anything out there that you're feeling like uh you kind of cringe when you hear oh there's tons of bad information out there um I, i think some of it comes down to um i think the supplementation world is really really bad um, when people rely on supplements or rely upon pharmaceuticals like an Ambien or something like that uh, on a long-term basis, that is not a good thing. Um, you know, I talk to people all the time. Yeah, I take melatonin nightly. And it's like, to me, I'm like, why? Um, you know, if you have to, you shouldn't have to rely on some substance to help you get a good night's rest on a daily basis. In a pinch, I get it, Right. If you have a, you know, uh, if you're going through like financial difficulties or a divorce or maybe a death in the family, and you just can't get some sleep and your doctor prescribes you a sleep aid. I think that's totally fine. Right. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But to rely upon that as a long term strategy to help you get a good night's rest is not something beneficial. There's something else going on there. Right. There's some other sleep hygiene issue or there's maybe a medic underlying medical issue. I don't know the answer, but If you find yourself that you need to rely upon some sort of, you don't have a diagnosed condition or you just are taking melatonin or whatever it is, right? I think that's not a good way to go. And I think people get caught up in the supplement thing too much of like, this will help me sleep. You know, it's a magic pill, which will get me better sleep rather than am I doing everything to optimize my world so i am in a better position to get a good night's rest right Mm -hmm. it's it's like it's like this right there's no magic pill for dental health right what do you do it's called dental hygiene you brush your teeth twice a day you spend a certain amount of time brushing all of your teeth um every day right we don't just randomly choose you know today i'm just going to brush my bottom teeth (laughs) right maybe tomorrow i'll do my top Right. So we don't do that. And there's no quick fix. There's not a supplement. There's not a pill that allows me to maintain good dental health without maintaining proper dental hygiene. And the same thing with sleep. There's sleep hygiene. Am I getting consistent hygiene of sleep? So like I consistently brush my teeth every day. Do I get a consistent bedtime and wake time? Right. And I know it's not always possible. I get that sometimes schedules and other commitments and and children and things get in the way. But for the most part. Am I getting good quality? So I brush my teeth with good quality or just kind of go through haphazardly, right? Do I sleep with good quality or do I not get good quality? And, and then again, you know, it's all on a consistent basis. So it's, it's, it's the amount of time I sleep and then it's the consistency and the quality. It's all three of those which lead to improved performance. Um, and not just, you know, on the sports field, right? But in life. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, it, it I'm, not playing any sports. So right now, and I'm, you know, I, I know how much work can be affected when, uh, when I'm not in, in a good place from, from the night before. For sure. Um, so let me ask you this. I've been telling people, you know, along the lines, Craig Ballantyne has his little 10, three, two, one, zero idea where 10, Hey, 10 hours before you're supposed to go to bed, don't have any caffeine, obviously stays in your body much longer than we think three hours before don't, eat it, try not to eat anything or, or have any alcohol if you can. Uh, two hours before, you know, get, don't, don't do any work, start, start to clear your mind one hour before no screens. Um, and so with the screen piece, I try, I've, I kind of give everybody a break. I say, listen, I know you're going to check your phone or you're probably going to watch TV. So, um, I try to get everybody to wear the blue blocker glasses. Are they really effective? Yes, they are. they are. And I think I think the glasses are the best w- route to go because everybody gets caught up in the screens and tied up with, you know, OK, I'm going to put I'm going to download uh, this app that makes my computer screen change color. I'm going to turn on my night shift on my iPhone and blue light. Right. Is a wavelength of light. 
and it's at its highest peak during daylight. So if you look at the, the, the wavelength of light and measure it during the day, that daytime has the highest amount of blue light, which decreases melatonin uh, production, right? So that's a good thing. We want it to keep us awake. That's why people are typically awake during the day. Screens, televisions, computers, iPads, tablets, phones, etc., also eliminate high amounts of blue wavelength light, very similar to that of daylight. So staring at these things also suppresses melatonin, right? So people get caught up in this, and which is great. I'm glad we talk about it. But what people do is they turn on the night. I have my, they say I have night shift on my phone. So, you know, I, I, if I do look at it, it it's the, the color has changed. So it's much warmer. But then what do they do before they go to bed, right? They go in their bathroom. They turn on this bright light, LED light, and they brush their teeth. And they spend the next 20, 25 minutes washing their face or doing their nightly routine. And it's like those lights also emit a fair amount of blue light. So all these LED lights that people are using these days throw out tons of blue light. So we forget about our, the rest of our environment. We get so caught up with screens. But yet if somebody goes in their kitchen and starts preparing lunches and those things for the next day without screens, but there's bright LED lights are pounding down on them, it doesn't make a difference. So in short, wearing those blue blocker glasses would help immensely because then it's blocking out that light for them. Okay. I really ought to get my wife to start wearing, wearing. she does. She has that 20 minute routine in the bathroom, you know, but yeah. um, you know, with the face and all, all the, whatever it's ridiculous but um i don't know it's funny because i've been recommending because it's been a game changer for me i almost felt like i wonder if i was kind of wondering if it was like almost in my head of a little placebo where i i kind of feel drowsy when i don't wear them i feel i definitely feel more awake and when i have the blue blockers on and i most of the time i do after 7 7 30 i put them on walk around my house with them um and I feel like I've been able to get to sleep much quicker. Fair. Cool. Let's go into um, some of the ready band stuff uh, sure. because now this is the next step. Okay. We can say uh, we can try tomorrow. We can try, like you had said, ask, ask those questions, you know, you know, what's the temperature? Uh, is it noise? Are you restless? I mean, I wear the, I wear shades too now. I, I've been wearing shades for a while, so I block Great. all those other things out as well all, all night, uh, which are which I absolutely I, I even have a pair I keep in my bag for travel. Um, so, um, but I feel like still there's always things that we still need. To, like I feel like man, I'm doing everything right, but if you if we go into my ready band. And we analyze it and because they have a great tool. You log in um, and um, and you could see all of these things. So why don't you just give us an overview? Of, like when you look at mine, what do you see? Okay, so uh, looking at your data, I see that you have a lot of fragmented sleep, which means you have a number of episodes where you wake up in the middle of the night. Um, and now this these episodes are may be perceived or they might not be, right? Meaning it could be just something to pull you out of your sleep. You might toss and turn a little bit. You may not even realize you woke up and you went back to sleep, or maybe you are recognizing these, right? And some of these, I can tell you were like moving around pretty good. Maybe you got up to go to the bathroom, maybe you even got out of bed in some instances, right? Mm -hmm. But what I can tell from this is that you wake up quite a bit. Right. So on average, there's this nice thing. It tells me sleep quantity, how many hours you you've you had and then awakenings per hour. Right. So you're like Wednesday, July 11th, you woke up one point five, seven times per hour. July 12th, you didn't wake up at all. July 13th, point six, nine times uh, per hour. Um so and it goes on from there. So it tells me that you wake up a lot. Now, I would say, I wonder why Anthony's waking up a lot, right? So then it wouldn't lead me to ask questions, you know, are you waking up to go to the bathroom? Um, which then we talk about hydration strategies because some people don't drink all day and then they go home at night and they pound the water and then they wake up four times in the middle of the night. Um, but maybe that's not you. Maybe it is pain with you. You know, maybe things are hurting. Um 
over this one week that I'm looking at. Maybe yeah, I put my back out or, you know, I, I jacked up my shoulder playing rec league softball. So, um, yeah, that's why I have been sleeping well. Oh, okay. Right. Then you just don't worry about it. Or maybe it's something else, right? I have a sick kid or my partner, you said your wife is kind of a, a, a restless sleeper, right? Yeah. She gets up a lot. So that could disturb you. Right. And, mm -hmm. and you may not even realize it disturbs you, but it, it, it does. So it, it gives me insights and information to say, what type of sleep is Anthony getting? You know, he might be getting, I just look at the summary. Oh, okay. He gets, you know, he got 7.3 and he got 8.6 and 6.5. So on, on, on average, he's averaging a good number of sleep. Great. We'll leave it at that. But in actuality, when I look at the detail, you wake up a good bit of times, mm -hmm. you know, like one, two, three, four, five, six times, seven times this one night here, um, four times this night. Um, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, ten times this night, right? Which is a lot. Yeah. So, you know, that would, if that went on long term, I would, you know, I'd say maybe you need to go see somebody, right? Mm -hmm. But unless you know why. I mean, again, I, there are certain points that if you looked, I, I think, again, I, I do like to have a glass or two of wine. Maybe that's part of it. I've always, and, and what I've noticed is once I started with the ready band, um, I, you know, you're a little more conscious, right? You're like, Oh shit. Now I'm getting monitored. I want to, um, I want to try to really, you know, work on this, it's trying to get to bed a little bit earlier or whatever. And what I did notice though, is I have been I'm, as, as much as I'm waking up because I've always been a restless sleeper. I've always been someone to like knock the sheets off. I literally like my sheets will come off. My wife will be like, what, what did you do last night? Mm -hmm. um, but I've, I haven't been doing that. That's one thing. So I think I've actually improved on the awakening on the awakenings per hour. I guarantee it. Cause I've been, I've been much better with, you know, again, blue blockers, wearing the shades, trying to limit the caffeine, even, you know, all, by the way, all this week, I, you know, I said, oh, I'm going to take the week off from any, any kind of alcohol. So, um, I'm hoping that helps as well. So I think, uh, those are some things for me. Uh, and again, my, with my wife, um, not being the greatest sleeper. She does get up a lot. Every little thing does wake her up. And she, I'm not blaming her. She just, you know, it, but she is right next to me. And so there are certain things. So yeah, those are some of the things that I feel like uh, I, I kind of need to I work on. Yeah, and that's something we'll also do is, you know, we'll have to, have to take a look at the partner sleep sometime, you know, and ask them those questions. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, it's too hot in here. Okay, well, let's just fix that. And all of a sudden it, that fixes it and everybody sleeps like a charm, right? Sometimes it's not that easy, but sometimes it is that easy. Um, sometimes it could be a noise issue, right? So maybe, uh, you know, like a white noise machine or something might help. Um, so there are some strategies that you can put in the place that may help your partner and then in turn can help you. Yeah, absolutely. We did have the noise one for a while and it was working well. And then it, it did break. Um, I guess we're using it too much. Um, we're looking to try to think about a little bit more with the, with like maybe a couple of the plants or like some kind of an ionizer, the ionizer, ionizer. Um, what, what are your thoughts on the plant and the, and the, uh, the air, air purifiers? Well, I mean, that's, I mean, I have an air purifier in my room and then, um, um, I've also used plants. Now, if you use plants, you got to be particular, right? So if you're looking at plants, you want to get what's called like a variegated snake plant, or sometimes it's called mother-in-law's tongue. And if you look at it, you'll know why. <laughs> um, but the reason why that one is so important to have in your bedroom is that releases oxygen at night, uh, as opposed during the day, like other plants. So you have to be very particular what, what type of plant you choose. Okay. So if it's a bedroom and it's at nighttime, you want a variegated snake plant. Nice. I like the mother-in-law tongue. Mother-in-law's tongue. Yeah, that's what it's called. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, and then the air purifier is also, you know, decent as well. Um, you know, again, but that's part of it, right? That doesn't solve noise. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't solve temperature. It doesn't solve light. So, you know, all those things are also need to be uh, addressed as well. Absolutely. Um, and making sure your your environment is optimized to get you a good night's rest. And uh, yeah. I'm looking at my data, 
wake after sleep onset is 40 minutes. Yeah. What does that mean? So yeah, your, your wake after sleep onset is averaging 40 minutes. So that means that after you, you fall asleep, 40 minutes later, on average, you have an awakening period for some reason, right? And that could be an alcohol issue. It could be, you know, something else. It could be maybe that's when your wife starts flopping around, right? Um, it's interesting with some people, you can actually see if they, they're really diligent with their, their bedtime. They go to bed the same time every night. Um, sometimes you'll see very similar awakenings across the board. And you can tie it into like a train that's near their house and mm. blows the horn and wakes them up, um, you know, like a construction zone or a neighbor that leaves their house at a certain time in the morning or whatever. So it's really interesting. But in your case, you, know, you don't go to bed the same time every night. Um, you know, you bounce anywhere between like 945 ish and like 1230. Right. So you're all over the place with your your time that you go to bed, which is something I would want you to maybe start to change a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so you, your your time is all over the place where you wake up. But you do have a lot of instances where you wake up. I mean, 20 minutes, 15 minutes, 40 minutes, 48 minutes, 95 minutes. So you're all over the place. But you you typically do not stay asleep for a very long period of time. Okay, that's a, so that's all with that. And then what is the – now there's another uh, sleep onset. What exactly yep. is that saying? That's when you fall asleep. Oh, it takes me so, 22 minutes on average to fall asleep? Uh, no, that, that's the time of day. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> so, so there is a sleep latency, which tells you how much it takes you to fall asleep. So if you go to your, your detail page – and then like say Saturday, May 5th, and you hover over that eye, it tells you that latency was 28 minutes, it took you 28 minutes to fall asleep. Okay. Yeah. So I time in, time in bed was nine hours. You had two awakenings. So, yeah. So the latency, is that something, when you look at that, what's going to be a red flag for you? Oh, if people can fall asleep within like a couple of minutes. That's a problem. Really? It means they have just a ton. They're just tired, okay. right? They have a lot of sleep debt. Yep. Okay. Let's talk about sleep debt really quick because uh, I'm a napper, so it doesn't yeah, always show up. Yeah, I saw that. Right okay, around you three o'clock. Yeah. <laughs> I, I am a big napper. I Sometimes it's just 20 minutes in the morning. and Sometimes it's two naps. Um, I got to get rid of my Yogi bow in the office because I just jump <laughs> on, I see it and I say, Hey, you know what? I'm going to go visit my Yogi bow. Um, but, uh, talk to us about this idea about, um, uh, you know, catching up on some sleep. So, you know, sleep debt is something which accumulates over a, a, a period of time. Um, and you can pay it back, but it does take time and it takes patience, right? You can't just do that in one night. Um, and that's what really a lot of these studies that Sherry Ma and Dr. Dement looked at were what happens if you pay back the sleep debt. So, you know, if we extend your sleep to where you can get 10 plus hours a night for multiple weeks, you know, then is where that's when we see the performance improvements um, happen. So same thing with, with us as human beings, right? We need to pay back our sleep debt. And and that's by getting more sleep, by extending our sleep. And you can also pay some of it back by taking naps. Now, something which should be said about naps is that taking a nap, getting four hours of sleep and then taking a four-hour nap is not the same as getting eight hours of solid sleep. Mm -hmm. Right? It's not the same thing. So we can't confuse and say, yeah, I get four hours of sleep, but then I take, you know, I take two two-hour naps or three, four, four, you know, one-hour naps. It's not the same. Right. But naps are great. If you have if you have ability to take a little cat nap in the middle of the day, maybe feel refreshed. Um, I think that's a fantastic thing. So naps are a good thing. The only time I don't recommend naps is if it interferes with your ability to get a good night's rest. So if you take a nap like at seven at night, mm. you know, and then you wake up like at eight and then all of a sudden you try to go to bed at nine thirty or ten and you can't sleep. That's a problem. Yeah. So your short little cap nap cat naps in the middle of the day, I think are, are fine. And I are great. Is there anything though we should like, like give us best practices with naps then as well? I mean, best practice is always realistic. Um, I would say the 20, 25 minute nap is ideal. 
Um, people sometimes say, if I'm taking a nap, you know, like when you're in college, I'm not taking a 25 minute nap. I'm gonna take a two hour power nap. Right. Um, so that's not always realistic in that world. Um, and some people can't take naps at all, but ideally that 20, 25 minute quick refresher nap is fantastic. Um, Sherry Ma told me about this thing called a nappuccino, which is really cool, right? Caffeine takes about 15 minutes to kick in. So if you take some caffeine, you, you lie down for 20 minutes, then you wake up, you have the benefits of that 20 minute refresher nap and the caffeine is kicked in. So you don't have any of that like residual grogginess or sleep inertia. Um, so you're, you're, you're really primed and ready to go. Awesome. Yeah. The yeah. Nappuccino, you were the first one that I heard talk about that. It was years yeah. ago. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. It was. Um, it's so funny because everybody loves to hear, like, when I say that the Nappuccino, like, they just cannot believe, like, come on, that's, that's awesome. They want to try it. Totally. <laughs> it just now, one cool thing, too. one thing I'm looking at your data, and this is a really cool thing about what the Fatigue Science Ready Band gives you, is it gives you an effectiveness score. So if I look at your effectiveness score, you know, like you have one right now and it's constantly moving throughout the day. And the effectiveness score really is an indication of your attention and reaction time. OK, so it, it, that has a huge correlation with performance, obviously. Yeah. Right. The attention you have and the more and the better reaction time you have. That's good. That's good if you're driving the car with children or even just driving the car in general. Um, that's great from a performance standpoint, like at the plate, like a baseball player in reaction time. Um, it, it doesn't matter what you're doing in terms of attention and reaction time. This is essential. So when I look at the percentage of time you spend in each, now remember the scale is zero to 100, 54% of the time, um, you spend between 90 and hundred, which is great. Um, 41% of the time you spend between 80 and 90. Right. So what does it what does this mean? It means that, you know, when you drop, when you get around 90, your reaction time is slowed by 5 percent. If you drop, below, you know, around 80, your reaction time is slowed by 18 percent. If you drop below 80, now your reaction time is slowed by 34 percent, which is equivalent to 0.05 percent blood alcohol concentration. It's amazing. Right. And these things aren't just guessing. These things, this algorithm is backed by 20 years of Department of Defense research. So it's not like some of these other sleep companies that are kind of like, you know, building the plane while they're flying it, right? This is like legitimate 20 years, multi-million dollar project to focus on effectiveness, sleep, reaction time, predictive modeling, and these types of stuff. So this is like, it's quality, right? It's 94% accurate. Um, which is pretty damn good. So this is a, interesting for me to look at from your standpoint to see, you know, where do you spend most of your time? And so you're pretty good here, right? So that kind of gives me a little bit of solace, right? But, mm -hmm. but there are days where you certainly spend between 80 and 90 where, you know, I, I would like to see you spend more time in between 90 and 100, but it's not awful. Yep. I'm working on it. I'm working on it. <laughs> yeah. Um, cool. Let's finish up two things. Um, uh, so, so I, actually, give me a couple of books. I know you've recommended some in the past, but if somebody wanted to go deeper with some of this stuff, uh, I know there was one on naps that you had said, but what are a couple of books that you really highly recommend? For, for Yeah, I still recommend Take a Nap, Change Your Life. Um, that's a fantastic book. Um, the Promise of Sleep by um, Dr. William DeMent, the guy I was mentioning about. Oh, yep. Yep. And then Ariana Huffington um has a book out uh gosh what is it um the name escapes me right now yeah i, I know what you're talking about the yes. sleep revolution okay yes okay yep i actually had to look it up but uh yeah sleep sleep revolution that's a great book i would recommend if you have children or going to have children and you're or you know you were talking about coaching coaching sleep right if your client or athlete is going to have a child or expecting one um Healthy Sleep Habits, Happy Baby, or Happy Child. Healthy Sleep Habits, Happy Child um, by Dr. Weisenbluth. That's a phenomenal book just in terms about talking about how parents can manage their sleep and how you can also manage your child's sleep and what to expect, and those types of things. Um, I think that's a phenomenal thing to, yeah. to buy, you know, because again, that's 
that's coaching, right? Empowering people is what coaching is all about. And if you can say sleep is important, it's important for you, it's important for your family, and here's a resource which you should be reading uh, while you're expecting the birth of your child, that will make your life much easier. Um, I think people appreciate that, right? Yeah. Because now, now all of a sudden you've been, you're influencing them outside of that one hour you're with them. Um, and hopefully you've been doing that anyway, but now you're giving them real strategies rather than, well, you know, sucks to be you. Good luck getting sleep, right? With the kid. No, (laughs) it's not. There are things you can do, right? And that we know that first six weeks are going to be tough, but there are things that you can do and strategies that you can employ and even tells you when you should get your sleep, right? And then it talks about once the kid is able to consolidate and, and be able to understand the difference between day and night, then things change. And here are some strategies you can do for them. So Really, really cool stuff. And then again, Ariana Huffington does that fantastic job with the sleep revolution and about how sleep, you know, lack of sleep is not a badge of honor. Um, it's not cool. Um, it, 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 it doesn't make you special and doesn't make you more successful. It actually hurts you at the end of the day. And, and if you talk to these people and, you know, I, when I talked to Dr. Demen about this, he spent most of his early career chasing down these individuals across the globe that said they got, you know, four hours of sleep a night or three hours of sleep a night and were very successful. And what he said, that was the biggest waste of money he ever spent because they were full of crap, right? <laughs> yeah. um, that just doesn't happen. Yeah. Um, so the fact that these people go and say, you know, I get three hours of sleep and, and you know, and I'm, I'm successful, that doesn't make you successful. And that doesn't mean everybody is going to be successful. And that's really just a bad way of thinking. If anything, you're creating more harm than help. Uh, you know, it's, 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 it's working smarter, right? Not working harder. Um, yeah, it's doing the right things that are going to allow you to enjoy and live life on your terms and the way you want to do it. Yeah. And, And if anybody's not convinced, I think, you know, just alone with this chart, with my effectiveness zones, you know, that reaction time, like you said, you get below 90, it's 5%. You get below 80, it's 18%. And then, you know, when you start getting even lower than that, you're looking at 34% reaction time and having that blood alcohol concentration of 0.05. That's affecting performance. And Coach Boyle, and we never really talked about this. We might have said this once or twice on the show later, but when he was at the Red Sox, what they found out, and he didn't want me to say it because he was still with the Red Sox at the time, was that they were finding out that um, a lot of the guys who had babies uh, that year, they 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 were like their their incidence of injury increased by like twenty percent. So they were monitoring now all the guys that had babies because their sleep was going down and they wanted to make sure that they didn't overwork them or overtrain them. And they wanted to give them uh, more rest that, that in that second year that he was there because they, they saw that the, um, the, the guys that had the baby were more likely to, uh, to get injured. Oh, without a doubt. I mean, we know from the research with adolescent athletes, if you get less six hours or less sleep a night, right, prior to an event compared to those who get eight hours or more, you're 1.7 times more likely to get an injury, right? And the other thing with sleep, and this is what, what you know, Mike found out with the Red Sox, is that you revert back to old habits, right, when you are sleep deprived. So these compensation strategies, which we've spent, you know, hours and hours of corrective exercises or rehabilitation and whatnot, those go out the window, right? Um, because you do not have that type of control you have. You have poor judgment of distance, speed, and time. Couple that with bad reaction time. Couple that with reverting to old habits, and it's the perfect storm for for having an injury. Yeah, insane. Um, yeah, and I will say what's really cool about this already, Ben. What they've done is they they you buy when you get these the the monitors when you get the ready band for your team uh especially if you're in in the college setting they can be used by other players you could just yeah. it doesn't it's not like oh okay I got a ready band for this one person it's almost like the heart the uh, heart rate monitors like you keep them there in your in your facility and they you know you can use them for other people now obviously not every day you just say hey Kate we're going to spend the next month or two months 
you're going to use this ready band. I don't have it on my uh, personal account because I don't have the team. I just see myself, but I saw some uh, really interesting, like it has all the players and it gives you, you know, a, whatever order, like who slept the, the least, gives you all the information without ever having to ask them, uh, right. hey, how was your sleep last night? No, it's, it's a fantastic tool. And it's like, it's, it's, it's in this day and age, you know, everybody's trying to adopt technologies and everybody's adopting a lot of crappy technologies, right? But, you know, when you have a piece of technology like the Ready Band that's 93% accurate to polysomography, which is what, what a, a sleep lab, right? 93% accurate. That's freaking awesome, yeah. right? That's better accuracy than most body composition tests that people utilize on a daily basis and hang their hat on, yeah. right? Um but when you have that ability tied in with an algorithm and, and, and research that's been developed by the military and millions of dollars and 20 years of research, it's like, why are you not utilizing this and leveraging this and seeking this out for your team, right? As, as something to help you make some better and more, inf you know, some informed decisions. You know, I'm not saying you're going to bench your best player because they had a crappy night's sleep, but, you know, if you're trying to figure out who's going to bat in the ninth spot, right? And you have a toss up between these two guys. It's like, well, all right, which one slept better? Yeah. I mean, right? You might as well go with that one. Exactly. So, uh, I mean, there, there's, there's, really, there's really no downside to it. Yeah. And I will say uh, kudos to Fatigue Science on the education that they do provide on the site and even on, in the app. And they've done a lot of videos. They really do a great job. So if you, if, if you need to explain things to your, to your team, to your players, it's really all right there for you. The other thing I like about them too, and then again, again this isn't trying, I'm not trying to turn this into a commercial. Yeah, form, we're not right? getting but, paid for this, by the way. So everybody knows no. I'm not getting paid. But you know, nor am I. But you know, it's 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 interesting. It's like they just try to focus on sleep. So that band does sleep, and there's a clock on it, right? Like a watch. Mm -hmm. They don't try and put a heart rate monitor yes. on there. They don't try and get fancy with these things. They don't try and predict your stages of sleep, which you cannot do from the wrist, right? Um, mm -hmm. but what they do is they've built a nice little piece of technology to give you insights to sleep, uh, how much time you've slept and the quality of that sleep. Yeah. So sleep quantity and sleep quality and consistency and it's, and, and the battery, you charge it once a month. I know right? it's crazy. <laughs> so, I mean, you can't beat that. They need to consult, uh, Apple on this. <laughs> and, totally. Um, so Besides, and again, I think every every coach should really think about uh, getting this program, especially in the college setting, because you can reuse them. And uh, you know, you have so many different teams, and you know, the next year you got new guys coming in. Um, so, besides using the ready band, I'm going to give you one minute to kind of give uh, this. I because again, I love this idea. You got to coach sleep. Give our strength coaches, give them best practices to kind of coach sleep. Well, I think the first thing you have to do is you have to make people aware that sleep is important. And I think a lot of coaches are doing this today, right? First thing you do is you fill out like a training monitor, which says, uh, how did you sleep last night? How many hours did you get? So that tells your client or your athlete that, yes, okay, sleep is important. I'm starting to ask it. But that only gives you a little bit or a small piece of the picture. Now you have to take it a step further and you have to start educating your clients and your athletes on this as well and start kind of overcoming some of this poor education or, and putting quality education in front of them. Talk to them about sleep, how it can impact performance, the good and the bad, because everything comes with a consequence, right? Sometimes they're good and sometimes they're bad. And sleep, getting good amounts of sleep, paying back that sleep debt has an amazing upside from performance, from a standpoint of skill, from a standpoint of, of mood, uh, anxiety, um, sprint speeds, reaction time, um, uh, glycogen replenishment. I mean, there, there is the worst thing about getting a good night's sleep is you feel better in the morning, right? That's the very worst thing. The, the biggest downside you have, right? Um, so again, I think that's the important thing is coaching sleep, putting it as a priority, holding your, your athletes and your clients accountable, um, and then helping them with answers, right? Cause that's the biggest thing. If they're not getting quality sleep, you have to give them a direction. And that's why you have to build a network and you have to have quality people to send them to. So if they are having issues, they say, man, I think I'm waking up gasping. That's not my world. I'm not, I'm not a, you know, a, a sleep physician. 
So I say you need to go see your primary care or you need to go see a sleep doctor or go see your athletic trainer or go see whomever on your medical staff to get this taken care of because that's not my world, but you need to get that taken care of. Very cool. All right. Yeah. Well, uh, I really appreciate you coming on and kind of, I know uh, sometimes, you know, we, we've talked about this in the past, but it really is important. And I want to, wanted to keep everybody up to date with uh, some of the new information, which you're always uh, uh, good at doing. So uh, Brandon, thanks so much for coming on and talking all about sleep. It's always a pleasure. Thanks for having me. And remember, I'll be talking about sleep at Perform Better in Long Beach. All right. Yep. That's coming up yeah. in August. Yeah. All right. So good stuff. All right. Everybody get out there and uh, he's going to talk more about that. All right, that's going to do for episode 235 of the Strength Coach Podcast. A special thanks to Chris Parr and the folks over at Perform Better. Right now, huge summer sale, 40% off. So many items, sleds, dumbbells, kettlebells, foam rollers, so many of their best items. Don't forget the summits are here July 27th to the 20th in Chicago. That's this weekend coming up. And then Long Beach on August 17th to 19th. You can check them out at performbetter.com for all their products and info on their educational seminars. Thanks to Coach Boyle and Brandon Marcello for sharing their insights and philosophies into the world of strength, conditioning, performance enhancement, and sleep. Thanks to Adam Doughty, Tim Robinson, and Train Heroic. Head over to trainheroic.com. Start your free 14-day trial. Let them know I sent you, and you'll save 10% off your first year of Train Heroic Pro Edition. I am using Train Heroic. It's really good, believe me. Alan Kajou for the Results Fitness University Business of Fitness segment. Check them out at ResultsFitnessUniversity.com. Great cook, functional movement systems. Check them out at FunctionalMovement.com. And of course, remember, you can try strengthcoach.com out. Three days, just a buck. Cancel whenever you want. If you stay on after the third day, you get charged either monthly or yearly, whichever plan you pick. You'll have access to all the articles, videos, and programs, as well as the best forum on the net. It's the only place to have full access to Coach Boyle. He's on every day. To access that offer, go to shrinkcoach.com. Click the Join Now button to get started on your trial. My name's Anthony Renna. Go to continuefit.com. Sign up for the Success Series, five audio interviews on success in the fitness business. Thanks again, and I'll speak to you next time.